Um, hello. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about advancements in ketamine treatment for depressants, uh, for depression, and why it's quickly becoming um, a really effective way to treat patients with depression. Um, so the big difference between ketamine and uh, you know traditional antidepressants um, is that ketamine, uh, the effects of ketamine set in hours after um, the person receives it, whereas traditional antidepressants, the effects won't become apparent until about you know a couple of weeks afterwards. So ketamine is a much uh, it's a much more um, sped up way of treating someone with depression. So my article for this presentation was based in New Zealand and Australia. So I'll start by talking about just the background of ketamine in these in these countries. So in Australia, ketamine is bound by regu regulations pertaining to its Schedule 8 drug status, meaning that it is considered to have a high potential for abuse and addiction. Um, so that differs from New Zealand, where it's a Schedule 3 drug, and it's considered to pose only a moderate risk of harm. Um, just for comparison, the United States uh, also labels ketamine as a Schedule 3 drug. Um, that's just for comparisons in this study, all of the participants um, were located in Australia or New Zealand. Um, and just in terms of like the permit required to um, use ketamine in a, in a, in a medical sense, uh, if the treatment period is less than two continuous months, there's no permit required. But if it's greater than two continuous months, an authority is required from the, uh, the Ministry of Health is what they call it. Um, in Australia, ketamine is currently approved as an anesthetic drug by the, the TGA, which is their, you know, medical governing body, um, but it's not currently licensed for treating depression. And so it's considered off label. And that means it's used for a disease or medical condition that is not technically approved to treat. Um, uh, off label ketamine has no license for treating depression, but it requires parameters informed by the models of care and guidelines in order to be used. Um, so one of the parameters is that off-label prescribing should only occur when therapy outside of the non-standard treatment is considered necessary and appropriate. So it's only after um, we've, we've decided that, that traditional antidepressants aren't really working. And so then they're allowed to shift over to using ketamine. Um, the uh, the RANZCP, again, another medical body, um, stated that the use of ketamine in treatment resistant depression does not recommend the use of ketamine in clinical practice. And they cite gaps of uh, gaps in knowledge about dosing, treatment protocols and effectiveness and safety uh, of long-term use. So that was in 2019 where um, they said that they, uh, the, you know, the medical governing body um, doesn't recommend ketamine yet. So the timeline for trial, um, pretty standard. It's your initial assessment, pre-treatment, your treatment, and then your follow-up. And then we'll talk about each of these, um, each of these entities next. So initial assessment. Uh, so a careful diagnostic assessment should examine whether the patient has a unipolar or bipolar condition, as well as any comorbid diagnoses. So it's really important that we check for comorbidity before we start treating these patients with ketamine. Um, those with severe suicidality in the context of the MDD may benefit from taking ketamine treatment um, because it's a rapid reduction in, in symptoms found in this patient group. So it, it actually is recommended if there's a strong, um, you know, current threat of suicidality for the patient, since the effects take much quicker to set in than, you know, than antidepressants. Um, there are also certain demographics that could have more success in the ketamine treatment. You know, not everyone has um, a really successful story of it, um, but studies have noted that the female gender and older than the age of 45 years old, um, there's greater, uh, also greater treatment resistant and higher levels of disability were factors in increasing the probability of a positive response to ketamine as opposed to a placebo. So that's just one certain demographic where there's a higher success rate and that's female genders who are over the age of 45 and maybe who have higher levels of disability. Um, you also have to be really careful about the comorbidity with personality disorders. Um, they warrant careful evaluation as ketamine has rapid onset and rapid effects, which may have complex interactions with personality-based um, personality disorders. Um, 
Additionally, just another comorbidity statistic is that patients with major depression and comorbid substance abuse also warrant careful consideration, um, given that, you know, ketamine, you know, has been used um, by many people for abuse. Um, and, you know, they, they just have people who have substance abuse in the past are more likely to abuse ketamine now if they if they get on it for for depression. Um, Additionally, screening for cognitive impairment may be additionally required. Um, you know, long-term ketamine, ketamine use has been associated with cognitive dysfunction. So it's just important in that, you know, before the actual treatment program begins, we start by looking at any comorbidities that may increase or decrease the effectiveness of ketamine. Um, in terms of the setting, it just should be comfortable for the patient, like a recliner chair, um, and that'll reduce the uh, likelihood of unwanted, you know, psychological effects. And just in general, before um, all of the vitals are taken, you know, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation. Um, so just all things beforehand. So making sure we have the, you know, we have maximum knowledge before the treatment begins. So pre-treatment for uh, and and treatment. Um, just some statistics about uh, of. Um, of treatment. Um, many of the original ketamine studies use an IV route, um, and that's typically an infusion, um, though ketamine can be uh, administered intramuscularly um, or subscutaneously. Um, those are just two alternate forms of injection. Um, many news reports have hailed ketamine as a wonder drug, um, but there's a lot of complexities that come with this. Um, so there's going to be measures apart from ketamine that will be likely required for overall recovery. So it's not just ketamine that will, that will, um, you know, stop or, you know, limit your depression. There's going to have to be other uh, steps along the recovery process that we, that we um, acknowledge in order to, you know, maximize the, the effectiveness of the ketamine. Um, so post-treatment and conclusions. Um, so there are a lot of side effects that come in the post-treatment stage. Um, lightheadedness, dizziness, poor coordination, headache, nausea, and vomiting. Um, so those are all just things to be aware of before. Um, they can vary in severity, you know, from, you know, very severe to, you know, almost no, no side effects at all. Um, so single dose randomized controlled trials have shown greater efficacy in ke of ketamine with approximately 70% response rate and 30% remission rate. So those um, statistics are really encouraging for the use of ketamine. Um, and then a recent non-traditional study found ketamine equally as effective as ECT therapy, electroconvulsion convulsive therapy. And that introduced the possibility that, you know, it may be an alternative to ECD, especially in patients at risk for ECT related cognitive side effects. So, you know, uh, alternative forms of treatment for depression also have, you know, certain um, risk that comes with it. So, you know, ketamine can be a, a pretty decent alternative for this. Um, another statistic uh, as it relates to the conclusion for this study is that, you know, a meta-analysis of 20 studies found a significant reduction of depression severity scores within two to three weeks with repeated dosing ketamine treatment. And these are medium to large effect sides depending on the dosing regimen. So the early effects of ketamine are pretty encouraging. Um, you know, it's still not mandated or considered to be uh, approved by a lot of health health governing body forms. Um, but I mean, these studies are just, you know, the beginning to, to make ketamine treatment for depression, um, you know, possible and more widespread. Um, there are need, there's a need for treatment guidelines to translate research findings into a model of care. So, you know, all of these, you know, pre-trials are just preliminary and, you know, there's going to be a lot more guidelines and a lot more research done so that we can make sure we do this in the, in the safest way possible. Um, there are like really like super, like almost, almost like miracles. They called a patient a super responder and that patient went into remission for five months after just one dose of ketamine. So as you can see, there's a lot of really, really encouraging uh, uh, findings from this particular study. Um, this was only, like, like I said earlier, in the umbrella of New Zealand and Australia. Um, so that's one kind of limitation of the study. We don't, you know, we haven't tested it on really different areas of the world or, or different cultures, um, but it's, it's, it's a good alternative and it has been, seemed to be particularly effective um, for those who don't receive um, 
you know, lessened side effects from antidepressants. Um, like I said earlier, it's really important that we make sure to try other kind of less risky or more, more researched um, ways of, of treatment before we get to the ketamine stage. Um, but however, um, we also need to make sure that these patients are monitored after they receive the dosage um, for a, like, you know, general side effects. But as I mentioned earlier, ketamine, you know, uh, in, in, in Australia, it is considered a schedule A drug um, so that it does have a high potential for abuse and addiction. So all these things need to be screened beforehand. So we have the most, um, the most you know, safe environment for the treatment. Um, I really found this article um, or this you know, study super interesting. And I think it definitely could be you know, the future for how we treat people with major depressive disorder and also those who um, have you know, comorbidities with, with things such as, um, such as bipolar disorder. Um, yes, so thank you very much. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, I hope you learned something about uh, how, we, how we're starting to treat patients through ketamine. Um, and that's it, thank you.